I'm Julia Nalivaiko and I was born in the USSR. When I was six years old, the Soviet Union collapsed. At age 12, I moved to the other side of the world. Ever since, I've been asked the same questions. What's it like over there? What's bought? Do they drink vodka like water? Do bears roam the streets? So now, I'm going back to find the answers. Ukraine was once known as the breadbasket of the Soviet Union. Although it covers less than 3% of the former USSR's landmass, it was producing as much as a quarter of its food. And with some of the world's most fertile soil, it's still renowned for its superior produce. And there's plenty of it. Local food markets remain Ukraine's favourite way to shop, manned mostly by an army of babushki. This is the place to find the freshest of everything. Be it veggies straight from the garden or milk straight from the goat, the markets provide a real taste of Ukraine. The intensely fragrant Ukrainian honey is gaining recognition as one of the best in the world. The sweetest fruit and berries, picked at the peak of their ripeness, are abundant throughout summer. Ukraine is the world's major producer of sunflower oil, and the highly aromatic roasted variety is one of the country's quintessential flavours. <laughs> But of all the tastes of the Soviet bloc, few are as recognisable as borscht. Borscht is a hearty beetroot-based soup, best served with a dollop of sour cream and a sprinkling of fresh herbs. Claimed by Ukraine as its own, many varieties of borscht are popular throughout Eastern Europe. It originated as a peasant dish made from readily available ingredients, but today it can be found on most menus. So for an upmarket take on this ubiquitous soup, I visit Café Pushkin, one of Moscow's most popular restaurants. Moscovites love a themed restaurant, and Café Pushkin does not disappoint. Its interior is modelled on the home of 19th century aristocrat, and the menu takes inspiration from the same era, as I find out from manager Andrei. Russian cuisine has a big influence from the French food, especially during the war in 1812 when the Napoleon came to the Russia. He brought a lot of recipes and he brought the champagne, for example. After that, the Russia loved the champagne. That's why we sell so much champagne. The stereotype of champagne and caviar, is that a real thing? Not really. It's just a thing that it's expensive, you know, expensive caviar, expensive champagne, and you should mix it together to make it the most expensive. But it's not true. In reality, it's, it's not no, a great combination. No, of course, of course. It's not a great taste, it's not a great combination. So. And caviar should come with what? Everybody thinks also with vodka, the caviar with vodka, but it's also it's not a good combination. So I suggest to eat it with wines. Another myth busted right there. People think Russian food is potatoes, onions, potatoes, but it's not true, is it? Yeah, that's not true and we have a very, I can say, even complicated food because a lot of the recipes are very complicated and we use all types of the products, the vegetables, meat, fish, greens and different herbs. That's why it's very interesting and um, different food. Russian cuisine may offer a multitude of options, but I know exactly what I want. So here's the borscht, it's traditional Russian and Ukrainian soup. Mostly it contains the beetroot, that's why it's so red. First of all, we boil different types of the meat. It can be beef, pork, 
We boil it, then we put some vegetables, it's potatoes, beetroots, uh, cabbage. And in our recipe, in the recipe of our restaurant, also we put some uh, honey apples. It's got a strong bacon smell and it just smells amazing. That's actually better than babushka could make. I don't think so, you know, the mama's <laughs> recipe is always better. But what I can say is that every Russian family has a different recipe of the borscht, so... And they think that theirs is the best one. Exactly, of course, of course. After sampling one of Russia's favourite dishes, I want to discover more about the nation's palate. And for that, I need only visit the snack food aisle of the local supermarket. Caviar, red or black, is a must at any festive occasion and holds a special place in the hearts of Russians. Fresh dill, abundant and incredibly fragrant, is used to flavour just about everything. Mushrooms of all kinds are used in a myriad different ways, but none is tastier than braised with sour cream. Shashlik is the Soviet bloc's favourite barbecue, a kind of shish kebab sold by street vendors everywhere. But the most authentic way to enjoy it is among friends in the outdoors. And my friend Vyacheslav knows just what it takes to make great shashlik. Маринад это что? Это уксус там и прочие специи там, ну, там приправы всякие разные там помидорки туда бросить, лучок туда бросить, еще что-то. Там э, мясо набирает совершенно другой вкус. То есть это уже не вкус мяса, это уже вкус чего-то другого. Шашлыка, да. A sprinkling of vinegar over the shashlik helps to keep the meat moist while also giving it its unmistakable flavor, and the burning coals impart an irresistible smoky aroma. Shashlik came to Russia from Central Asia, where cooking meat is considered exclusively man's work, and this tradition lives on. Это как мужчина не умеет резать салат и заниматься домом, так же женщина не умеет готовить шашлык. Ну слава богу, что мужчина умеет резать мясо. Нашел его. Слава богу, что кроме того, что они пьют пир, не умеют еще резать мясо. Knowing that my place is in the kitchen, I whip up a garden salad to accompany Vyacheslav's perfectly cooked shashlik. The table is set and we get down to the serious business of eating Russia's favorite barbecue. Это не традиционное русское блюдо. Оно де факто традиционное русское блюдо. Его готовят на каждой даче, каждые выходные все люди. А почему? Ну потому что оно вкусно. Вот. Да, потому что оно вкусно. Как вкусно? Получилось. Так что за твои шашлыки выпьем, давай. You taste the shashlik. What do you think about it? Очень вкусно. Over several centuries, the various national dishes of former Soviet republics have intermingled to create a universal Soviet cuisine. But over the past 20 years, influences from the East and the West are becoming more prominent. Kiev's restaurant Tampopo under the guidance of pioneer restaurateur Margarita, serves a fusion of Japanese, European and Ukrainian cuisine. The presence of soy sauce, of olive oil in this food, these are ingredients that have just not existed in Ukraine for 15-20 years ago. And now they are slowly coming into the kitchen and become... I'm saying they are integrated. You know, the culture, the mode, Кухня, она микширует, то есть она уже такая происходит диффузия. Традиционной украинской кухни уже давно нет. Поскольку мы все уже путешествуем, живем и следим за своим здоровьем, то мы предпочитаем есть э, облегченные варианты блюд. Овощи свежие, заправленные какими-то интересными соусами, опять же, которые не усложняют блюдо, а наоборот подчеркивают. After an entree of summer greens, our main course is a buckwheat risotto with chicken livers and mushrooms in soy sauce. This dish combines Asian flavors, European methods, and traditional Ukrainian ingredients. Mm -hmm. Хоть это фьюжн, вкус остается настоящей украинской кухни. Белые грибы наши, 
печенка наша, гречка наша. То есть, если говорить о правильном питании, нужно питаться теми продуктами, которые растут, произрастают здесь на Украине. Мы всегда смотрели на Запад. Мы говорили, вот если на Западе это кула, а если здесь это фунт, там, типа не то. Сейчас, слава богу, патриотизм начал просыпаться в людях. И мы уже гордимся тем, что мы это сами производим и сами готовим. Мы сейчас говорим, нет, это фермерское, это выращено у нас вот тут под Киевом. Food and culture have always been closely linked in Ukraine, with social gatherings usually taking place around the dining table. Что такое украинская кухня? Это задор, это всегда э, застолье шумное, громкое, когда люди смеются, что-то рассказывают. Да? Вот. То есть это может быть э, совершенно меняться от э, местонахождения. Если вы поедете в село, вас будут встречать хлеб, соль, сало, горилка, поросенок на столе, там вот все будет, почеревка, деруны, картошечка. Но если вы приедете в город, то вы найдете массу ресторанов, в которых будет потрясающая кухня из, из натуральных продуктов, которые выращены в Украине. Но поданы поварами те, которые прошли большую школу, опыт европейских поваров, которые взяли лучше от Украины, лучше от европейской кухни. И все это смешали и подали на тарелки. Сегодня вы в этом могли убедиться. Абсолютно убедились. As exciting as modern restaurant cuisine may be, there is something wonderfully comforting about traditional dishes. The former USSR is home to three main types of dumplings. And while they have different origins, they are loved by people throughout the Soviet bloc. So it's no surprise that my lesson in making the Central Asian manti takes place in a tiny St. Petersburg kitchen. Making manti starts with the dough, made by mixing flour with milk, kneading it until smooth and leaving it to rest. Traditionally, the filling is made with lamb, but today we're using a mixture of finely diced pork and beef. Once the dough has rested, it's rolled and portioned, then topped with the filling and dollops of butter. Shaping the manta is an art form in itself and much harder than it looks. With some perseverance, I managed to make enough to fill a steamer. Just before serving, they're garnished with more butter and chopped parsley. Seasoned only with salt and pepper, the flavors are simple and delicate and perfectly complemented by various sauces. And the verdict? Очень вкусно. Operation Monthly, great success. For the Siberian dumpling equivalent, I visit St. Petersburg's restaurant Nep, where head chef Yekaterina greets me with a bowl of pelmeni. Pelmeni? Ну, как обычно, свинина говядина, 50 на 50, репчатый лук, в принципе, фарш, а тесто, мука, соль, яйцо. Mm. Как бабушкины. Pelmeni are similar to manti, but smaller in size and usually served with sour cream. Ну, только то, что могут быть начинки другие, но, опять же, если другая начинка, то тогда уже называется вареники. Вареники are the Ukrainian version of dumplings, and making them is a ritual in most households, as I learned in Kiev from my friend Alexandra. Almost everybody does it, at least once a year. Alexandra starts by mixing the dough using flour, egg, buttermilk and baking powder. Years ago, when I lived with my family, we usually did it uh, on Sunday, on Saturday. We gathered all together and uh, we did a lot of vareniki for all the family. Unlike pilmeni, fillings for vareniki can have countless variations, both sweet and savory. For sweet vareniki, all kinds of berries can be used, or my favorite, sour cherries. But today, we're making something a little different. Vareniki with apples, it's not uh, uh, a tradition, but a bit of like <laughs> modern type vareniki. It's easy to get apples, so for vareniki it's a good choice. Vareniki are differentiated by their traditional crescent shape. They're usually boiled, but can also be steamed for a lighter texture. 
they are served hot with a few compulsory dollops of butter. Tasty and satisfying, Mariniki are the key to the heart of any Ukrainian. Mm. That is really good. Fluffy and fresh and delicious. The flavors of the Soviet bloc are a feast for the senses. And the Russians are no strangers to a luxurious feast, an ancient tradition still going strong. A regular dinner at home often consists of several courses. And when it comes to welcoming guests, a table buckling under its own weight from the sheer number of dishes is standard practice. So to discover the history of the Russian spread, I visit Moscow's restaurant Turandot. It's housed in a replica 18th century palace, the type Russian nobility would have called home. The restaurant's cuisine could be described as East meets West, then East and West run away together to elope in Tsarist Russia. In the luxury of one of its dining rooms, manager Alexander gives me an insight into Russia's culinary history. Говоря о русской кухне и уходя немножко в историю, даже в прошлый век, это не только русская кухня, это и кавказская кухня грузинская, это и армянская кухня, это украинская кухня. Все вот это мы считаем как будто бы нашей. Если это Кавказ, то это шашлык. Если это Украина, то это борщ какой-то с помпушками. Если Армения, то это, наверное, долма. And if it's turandot, it's a dressed up fish and a salad with a tree. The salad is an ornate version of the very popular Olivier salad. Known worldwide simply as Russian salad, its main ingredients are potatoes, eggs and cured meats, all dressed with mayonnaise. Большое заблуждение, что русская кухня бедна. Она очень богата и разнообразна. Может быть, они мало знают в мире. Дело в том, что э, с древних времен наши купцы любили очень погулять. Это есть в, в крови у русского человека. И именно тогда устраивались большие огромные банкеты с шикарным застольем. Представьте себе целые осетры огромные, поросята молочные, лебедеи подавали. Огромная страна, представьте себе. Поэтому э, можно было найти практически любые продукты, но русские люди любили очень закусывать рыбными закусками. Это икра черная, икра красная с блинами. Это выпекались всевозможные пироги, с растягая с разными рыбами. Это и семга, это и осетрина, заливное всевозможных рыб, желированное. Next on the menu is a baked sturlet, which is a small species of sturgeon. The sturgeon, famous for producing black caviar, is popular throughout Russia. Here it's prepared in a honey sauce with a hint of curry and served with baby corn and asparagus. Вот это маринованное стерлить, то, что любят русские. Такая нежная, такая вкусная. Да, это же семейство сетровых очень нежное. Поэтому то, что мы говорим с вами о том, что наша кухня бедна, нет. Надо просто о ней, ее изучать нужно, ее нужно приезжать к нам и пробовать. From a restaurant filled with 18th century Russian spirit to a bar stocked full of Russian spirits, this is City Space, one of Moscow's best cocktail bars. I've come here to visit Moscow's number one mixologist, Bek Nazi, who's promised to divulge some of his bartending secrets. Bek is a local celebrity, and in his show, The Night Alchemist, he explores the ancient art of cocktail making. For Beck, inspiration often comes from the most unexpected places. Once I was on a train from Moscow to St. Petersburg and I was really impressed with these train glasses, you know. So I came up with an idea of creating a cocktail that would be very much related to the Russian railway, named after Trans-Siberian Express. So it would I have came to be up a very long drink. A very a long drink and also all the ingredients must have a meaning, you know. So what I've, what I've chosen for this drink is the Sibakthon Berry Jam, which is very authentic and medicinal and it's quite good 
uh, for um, uh, raising your immune system. Put some orange. And of course, vodka. I need some lemon juice, just to give it a touch of citrus. And a freshly pressed ginger, to make it a spicier. So we just heat it up like this. Heating the cocktail will release the flavours, making it more zesty and pungent. I would garnish it with a sprig of rosemary because it's got a pine smell and uh, when you ride on the rail Through the pine and, and, trees Yeah, through the pine trees and you open the window and you can actually feel the, the smell of the forest and I garnish it with this uh, dried, uh, dried orange chip That looks spectacular There you go Trans-Siberian Express Здоровье That's amazing <laughs> Please introduce this on the official menu of the Orient I will, Express. I will, I will, I will. Your clients here, what do they really expect from Russian bar culture? To be honest with you, we get a lot of um, uh, guests coming in that don't want to drink a cocktail. They want to drink a local beer, a local vodka, uh, and they're always asking for directions to the strip club. Uh, <laughs> Why they're not asking for cocktails? Because some of them cannot believe that in this city you can find a decent cocktail or, well, if I want a cocktail, I would um, shoot off to London or Manhattan, you know? But we're slowly changing their mentality and showing them that we have our own mixologists and uh, we're, we're trying to do as good as uh, our colleagues in um, Western Europe and the West. And uh, they seem to be listening to us. And one of these new tastes is Beck's version of an old classic, the White Russian. I had a lot of foreigners coming to this bar and wondering, oh, why don't we try a real White Russian in this bar, since we're in Russia. But not many of them actually knew that uh, it's an American cocktail created by an American bartender in New York. So I came up with, uh, with an idea of creating something the same in color, uh, closer in taste, but uh, with authentic ingredients, not this coffee liqueur, because Russian culture is not about coffees. Russia has a tea drinking culture. So I've uh, came up with an idea of using kvass. Kvass, as any true Russian will tell you, is the most refreshing drink for a hot summer's day. Before Coca-Cola penetrated the Iron Curtain, Kvass was available on every corner from street carts throughout the former Soviet bloc. It's a fermented drink based on rye bread and tastes like a sweet non-alcoholic beer. And I love it. We've got one litre of uh, kvass right in this saucepan. I would add some uh, cinnamon bark and about three star anise. Half a spoon of sugar here. What happens, it gets thicker, it becomes more like a rye bread syrup. So about 50 mils of rye bread syrup, right in the mixing glass. 50 mils of authentic Russian liquid. How, how do you choose? Right. There are so many. Well, <clears throat> rougher the better, okay? So then we need some ice. Stir it with my golden spoon. Then we strain it right in this chilled glass. And then we follow by um, vanilla cream. Voila, this is the white ruski, the very authentic white Russian with no coffee liqueur, with authentic rye bread syrup. Please try. I've never been a fan of the classic white Russian, so I'm keen to see if Beck's version is an improvement. That's actually what a white Russian should taste like. <laughs> if Russia is synonymous with one word in the minds of most Westerners, it's got to be vodka, and for good reason. Where else can one find a dedicated vodka aisle in the supermarket? In Russia we have an expression, if you drink in the morning, it means you are free for all day. <laughs> Russians like to drink it, uh, not with the juices or uh, energizers. It, it is an authentic drink that is always chased with food. Vodka is still a big part of Russian culture? Still is in Russia, but we're in Moscow. Moscow is a totally different city. Uh, vodka in Moscow is mainly for 
older generation, especially government people, they like to drink uh, vodka in an authentic way. So the stereotype of the Russian man drinking bottle after bottle of vodka doesn't apply to the new generation? Not to the new generation raised in St. Petersburg or Moscow, mainly Moscow. But in other regions, yeah, you can, you can see that it still applies to younger generation. I would say um, other regions are more like still in the Soviet times. As night falls, I decide to sample the changing face of Russia's bar culture firsthand. And after a few more of Beck's cocktails, I could be forgiven for thinking I was in New York or London. And while a Soviet mentality may still exist elsewhere, you'd never know it's sitting here.